Hi, ladies and gentlemen. Um, hope you enjoy your lunch, and thank you for coming back here for our talk. We are a group of researchers based in Singapore. My name is Hun Wei. Um, I represent NCS. It's a digital and uh, technology service provider, and I run the cybersecurity R&D team. And with me is uh, my collaborator, Levy. He used to work for NCS, and is now a senior research scientist with ASTAR, which is a national research uh, institute in Singapore. And before I start, just want to uh, acknowledge and thank the uh, NUS NCS Research Lab for supporting our works. In the first half of last year, there were 124 car thefts, including 42 luxury cars occur in a city in Canada called Oakville. The city has only about a couple of hundred thousands of uh, residents. And that's quite a lot of car thefts for a relatively small city. And more than 50% of the car thefts involve keyless technology, targeting a broad range of cars, including Lexus, Range Rovers, Ford, and etc. And in a separate incident in April this year, a warning statement was issued to the public of a mid ulster in Northern Ireland after six cars were stolen without using the original car keys. Basically, the car owners still had their keys with them. And there are more such incidents reported in the media. These days, it's feasible to steal a car without even physically breaking into the car, without having access to a car key or alerting the car owner. The increase, um, the, the rise of car theft has been reported not just in the public media, but also by automotive-driven uh, industry forums such as Auto Isaac, right, which is a global community for sharing threat intelligence about emerging automotive cybersecurity risk. In their annual threat assessment report, one of their key judgments was that the, the, the risk of keyless car theft will continue to rise. In general, there are two types of threat against keyless entry systems, non-intrusive and, in and intrusive. The non-intrusive types usually involve eavesdropping or manipulation of radio signals without having access or making changes to the underlying components of the keyless entry systems. For example, an attacker could use very simple signal jamming to prevent a lock command from reaching a car so that the car remains unlocked. The other examples are relay and replay attacks. And there are some differences between the two. A relay attacks is usually performed real time uh, with the intention to extend the boundary of communication range between a car and its corresponding uh, key fob. On the other hand, a replay attacks is usually performed offline. The attacker first captures the signal and then will only replay it at a later time. Attack on key management and cryptographic algorithms are more intrusive as they require direct access to the in-vehicle network, for example, ODB port or ECUs. Uh, furthermore, these are usually more uh, sophisticated and delicate as they require more expensive, potentially more expensive devices and technology, and also deep knowledge in cryptanalysis and um, reverse engineering skills, skill set as well. In this talk, we're going to focus on non-intrusive replay attacks. If you do a quick search on replay attacks on cars, these are probably some of the recent headlines that you would find. There was an article about um, a, a hack on Honda vehicle published earlier this year by Blipping Computer. Two researchers discovered a hack that allowed them to unlock Honda Civic. What's interesting about this was that they show that codes transmitted by key fob can be flipped to perform a different function. For example, uh, the code corresponding to a lock command can be turned into an unlock command by flipping some of the bits in the codes. Separately, uh, in another article which, which was published very recently, just a few weeks ago, uh, also targeting Honda cars, Two researchers discovered that a Honda car can also be unlocked by sending 
commands in a consecutive uh, sequence. And by the way, no offense to those uh, who work for Honda. Um, this is just based on what I found. Um, in fact, I'm a great supporter of Honda uh, because I own a Honda Jazz. But please don't hack or steal my car. It's a, it's a very old one. So um, why, why does our findings uh, matter? We started our research on this topic about 15, 16 months ago by <clears throat> trying to replicate some of the previously reported uh, replay attacks. In doing so, we had our initial discovery around August last year when we observed an unusual behavior that uh, a car can be unlocked using or by replaying two consecutive unlock signals within five seconds. Right? Two signals and it has to be within five seconds. We thought that that was quite an interesting finding. As researchers, we wanted to know if it is re repeatable and can be generalized. So we tried that on uh, more cars in the next uh, few months, but we didn't make much progress. The breakthrough came uh, subsequently in one of the car tests that we carried out sometime in March this year, when we discovered that a car can also be unlocked using more than two consecutive unlock signals, right? and not necessarily within a, a time, uh, specific time window. And what was uh, really exciting was that in addition, we also discovered other attack metrics that work across different car makes and models. So now our findings become very interesting because we show that it's more than a simple replay attack. Right? It's about different ways and, and variations of how we can use or we can replay signals um, using different attack parameters. I'm just giving you a teaser for now. If you are interested in the details, uh, please stay tuned. Uh, another interesting observation we made was that um, we found that our findings seems to be consistent with some assessment performed by um, Tatcham Research. It's, it's a UK-based company that provides security, security assessment on vehicle technologies. So a couple of years ago, they assessed 30 new cars um, on whether they have commonly accepted security measures in place, including resistance against digital car theft. So in comparison to our findings, those that were rated poor or basic in their assessment tend to also be vulnerable to our rollback attack. And on the contrary, those that are rated superior in their assessment also tend to be safe against rollback. And as far as responsible disclosure is concerned, we reached out to two of the affected uh, key fault uh, chip manufacturers, and one of them uh, got back to us, and we had a very dis uh, good discussion with them, which then uh, led uh, us to uh, give, a, give a sharing session with all the affected uh, car OEMs via auto ISAC. And uh, since then, we were told that the relevant car vendors and their respective suppliers have started their investigation into the root cause. And with that, I'm going to hand over to Levy, um, who did an amazing job um, to bring this research to the next level from where we began. He's going to walk through with you our discovery journey by sharing the details of findings, including how we have adapted our research strategy along the way. Thank you, Humboy, for the quick introduction. So let me uh, quickly go into the details. Let me first talk about rolling codes, a system that has been designed more than 20 years ago. It's quite prevalent and the reason why it was defined to actually prevent any replay attack. But the reason why you're here is to see that it's still not 100% sufficient. So the way how it works is quite easy. So every time you press an analog button on your key fob, basically every signal is unique. So you won't find any two signals emitted from the key fob, which looks the same. And the way how it works is that when you press the button, there's a counter in the key fob, and there's also a counter at the car. And every time the signal is received by the car, it also increases a counter for the next uh, future use. And if all these counters are in sync, it means that everything is OK and the car unlocks. But there is a safety provisioning feature embedded into the system because of accidental button presses. Because this is 
something that usually happens. You just have a kid playing around with your key fob or just accidentally your pocket comes to life and then presses a button uh, and of course outside of the vicinity of the vehicle. For these purposes, there is a provision made in the system, so it is basically allowed to do so, so the key fob can be in a more advanced state regarding the counters uh, compared to the vehicle itself. And basically when you go again to your vehicle with your key fob, which has had the advanced counters, you just send it again a new signal and they will be resynchronizing again and everything works as it should be, as it should be working. So now from this you can already imagine that basically there is some sort of a straightforward exploit into this, right? Because if an attacker can capture those accidental button presses, then eventually you can take those signals and you can go to the vehicle and then basically it's a straightforward exploit. So you can get access to those future codes and then you can access to the vehicle. Uh, but the thing is that the reason why most of the uh, vendors do not really care about it is because obtaining such future codes are extremely difficult, especially if you want to target someone. It's might easy to prank your friend or your mom. You go to a coffee shop, you pay your friend a couple of coffee, goes out to the restroom, and then you take the <laughs> key for from the table and, and, and record the signal. That's fine. But normally it's extremely difficult to, to get them. And the thing is that recently, I mean, we are, keep saying recently, but it was almost seven years ago when there was this famous, or I would say infamous attack called Rojam, which was basically uh, using a, a careful sequence of signal jamming, capturing, and replaying to lure the victim into a situation where you can get those future codes easily. And the thing is that even the author of it, who was Semi Kamkar, uh, I think that guy is much more famous than we are, uh, but the thing is that even he said and many other researchers said that that attack is not a hack, so it's not something like breaking an encryption key or something, it just basically converts this safety provisioning feature into an exploit. So the way how it works, let me quickly also go through that because it's easier to understand first how it worked and then when I talk about our attack, it will be much more easier to see how similar it is or how much it differs from this Rojam attack. So Rojam attack is basically you have a small device that nowadays you can get even less than 30 US dollars and what that device can do is basically it can capture signals, it can jam the frequency band and it can also replace signals. And the way how it is, deployed is basically it's, it acts as a man in the middle proxy between the key fob and the car. So it's, this device is something that you hide in a hidden spot near to the vehicle and then it has a clear reception of the signals and it can also jam the frequency band. So the way how it works is that you the owner come back to your parking lot where you left your car, you press the unlock button once because you want to get onto your car and then this Rojam device sits in between the car and you and then basically jams the frequency band which makes the car uh, unable to receive the signal. And at the same time, what it does is that it also captures the signal. And then since the vehicle won't react because the signal was jammed, is that what do we do? We are just human beings. We just accept maybe the button, the, 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 bu the button was not working or there was a lousy signal reception, so we just press the button again. And then what the device is doing is basically the same, so we are still keep jamming the frequency band, we are still capturing the consecutive second analog signal, but here comes a catch because at the same time then we replay the previously captured signal and then basically the vehicle will act as intended. We, the owner, just assume that there was indeed a, a, a lousy signal reception, everything is fine, I anyway want to drive away my car so I'm not going to think about why it was not working for the first time, I'm just happy it was working for the second time. So then the thing is that the attacker is now basically having that future code which is now turned as unlock signal two and then it basically follows the victim until a point when the victim will leave the vehicle again, locks it and go home or just do the grocery, whatever, and then the attacker can come and instruct this device or whatever other means, but the thing is that when replaying the second unlock signal what he or she captured, then he will have access to the car. Okay, so now let's see how our attack, which is kind of like capturing the same name but because of how it works we termed it as rollback, it's a time agnostic resynchronization attack. And the way how it works, uh, I'm going to go through the same example just to make a, a good comparison to rollback. So basically the setup is similar. So we have a device which can capture, jam, and replace signals. Uh, and the way how it works, the first step is basically the same. So you go to your vehicle, you try to unlock it, you press the button, but nothing happens because we are jamming the signal and we are also capturing your unlock signal. And what happens next is, is, is already something that it's different from rollback is that 
for the second time, we don't really care about whether the vehicle receives that second signal or not. The only purpose why we jam for the first time is because we want you to press the button twice to capture two signals. But we don't care whether the vehicle receives it or the vehicle can be unlocked, doesn't matter. And if I just continue this doesn't matter kind of approach, the thing is that we even let the vehicle to be used as normal. So you can keep using your key fob, you can lock it, unlock it, lock it, unlock it as many times as you want. I, I'm the attacker, I don't have to follow you uh, to the next spot to see when will you leave again your vehicle attended. It doesn't matter. The thing what I can do is basically you just, I wait for the right moment where you leave your vehicle unattended, and then I just get my t two unlock signals that I captured before, and I replay it, and it's done. Basically, for some reason, the vehicle or most of the vehicle get unlocked, and then you have access to the car. So the way and why do we call it rollback, and what are the advantages compared to Rojam? So why rollback? I don't know how familiar you are with some old traditional uh, database systems, but rollback is a mechanism in traditional uh, database systems when basically before committing all your changes, you can issue this rollback command which basically goes back to your previous checkpoint. So that's why we are calling it rollback because we've seen that when we are replaying these signals, uh, these kind of rolling code counters are rolling back to a previous state and then from there again, all the signals that should be invalid already start to work again. Um, so basically, this is a quick example to see. So what you can see on, this, on, on the image is that we have five signals, and all the five signals have been emitted from the key fob and also received by the vehicle. So in, in the time, we are somewhere here at the end. So the last unlock signal was received, the vehicle acted as, in, as intended, and whatever. And we also have all the signals, just to be sure. And then according to how the rolling code system works, right, it means that all these signals are invalid and cannot be worked again. What we can do is that if I'm actually captured the signals and I replay these two signals here, the first two one, what we've seen is that basically we are rolling back the rolling codes to the state which was encoded in the second signal that we replayed. Uh, and of course, according to again how rolling code system works, those two signals will be invalid again, but eventually all the signals that were basically after that point, which should be already invalidated, starts to be valid again, just because we roll back. It's kind of like a time machine. We just roll back everything. And that's why we call our attack time agnostic. And uh, the thing is that just because of this feature, uh, unlike to roll jam, basically we can launch this attack at any time in the future. So I don't have to follow you. I just capture your two signals or three signals, whatever. I'm going to talk about that later. And I can launch my attack any time. Uh, and the thing is that I can also launch it as many times as I want. So it's very easy for the attacker. I just capture your signals once, and I can basically relaunch it indefinitely uh, against your vehicle. So that's why we call it kind of like more effective than Rojam, but as we, you will see at the end of my presentation about the results, why Rojam is something that is tricks with the technology, so it basically breaks all rolling code-based systems. Our attack is something that is, uh, probably affecting 70% of the vehicles, but this is just about the set of vehicles that we tested. So we don't know the exact numbers, but for, for, some, uh, for now we at least found uh, some vehicles that are not actually susceptible to attack. And on the other hand, we also seen that there are different systems in the system, which basically means that we have different variants of rollback. And the properties that this attack has is basically one of the first properties, which is very important, is that how many signals I have to capture to get access to your car. Uh, this is a very important, is it just two signals or there are some cars that might require you to capture three signals or five signals? And why is it important? Because capturing two signals is probably not as difficult as finding someone who will press the button five times, for instance, consecutively, because that's very suspicious. Uh, so it's a very important feature. The other thing is that what we have also seen that once you capture the signals, do those signals have to be really strictly consecutive? Or is it okay if you just capture two signals, let's say one on Monday and one on Friday, and in between maybe uh, the owner was using the key for a hundred times? It doesn't matter. And the third uh, property, what is important is the time frame. It's, it's not that important though, because you can really play around with the time frame, but the time frame here defines how fast I have to replay these, uh, these captured signals. And the variants that we see is basically we identified four variants so far, so it doesn't mean that we only have four, maybe there are more in the wild, but we just didn't find it. The, the first one, which I really have to emphasize, is that that's particularly alarming, because the first one requires only two signals to be captured, and the sequence part lose means that 
those signals don't have to be consecutive, which means that I just follow you once, you press the unlock signal on Monday, and then I see you again uh, next, next week, you come to the work, and then I again capture your unlock signal, and by just replaying those two, I can basically access your vehicle. So I'm really reducing the chance, basically, of being caught when I'm capturing your signals. And the rest are basically uh, a little bit um, more difficult in, in terms of uh, how many signals you have and how consecutive the signals have to be and all these things. So before getting into the details, I have to make a disclaimer. So we haven't done any real attempts in the while, and we always remove those signals that we captured, uh, except two cases when we were trying to prove, at least for ourselves, the time agnostic feature of rollback that I just mentioned before. And uh, the other thing I have to emphasize that just like rollback, any kind of replay attack by default doesn't make any harm to your vehicle. I don't want to say this to just rush home and try our attack on your own vehicle, but it's something that doesn't make any harm to the, to the car. Sometimes you might get uh, locked out by, being, by having your key fob uh, banned for a while, but eventually by using the physical keys, you can always get access to your car and then do some resynchronization tricks without basically bringing your car to the workshop. So it's, it's, it's not a big thing. Um, so the, the evaluation we have done is quite limited for now. Um, so we basically had access to a couple of uh, Japanese cars mostly, or like Asian cars. No wonder why we're coming from uh, uh, Southeast Asia. So basically what we can make here is some kind of a blurry conclusion still. So what we have identified that at least the vehicles that we found vulnerable, the age doesn't matter because this is something that most people will think about it. Yeah, you found a vulnerability that might affect some old vehicle. I just bought my car two years ago, so that's probably not affected. But this is not what we have seen. So we have seen a 10 plus year old car or even two years old car that were acting in the same way and being vulnerable to the attack. The other thing is that the drivetrain also doesn't matter, so you cannot say that, okay, I'm driving a hybrid or I'm driving an electric car, which probably means there are more electronic systems inside of it, there are some NE software or some further measures that might prevent this. No, the remote keyless entry system is probably the same, doesn't matter how your vehicle is basically uh, made. And uh, the most important part is that all of the popular Asian cars that we have tested are affected, and actually some of these cars are also very popular in the US and all around the world, so that's why it's quite important. And we have seen that like all tested Mazda, Honda, and Kia vehicles were vulnerable. And for some reason, we found that Toyota is not. So who is driving a Toyota? Uh, then you, you don't have to go home and, and try this, because at least the Toyotas that we had access to, they were uh, not vulnerable at all. And the other thing what we tried to find is, uh, OK, I forgot to mention that some of the details on the slides are purposely obscured, but it's going to be released soon, probably a couple of weeks later after Black Hat, to release, reveal what are the models that we have tested. But we are still in, in kind of like in the middle of the, some clearance process, so we cannot reveal those models for now, and also not the, our key manufacturers. But what we have identified that uh, manufacturer two and manufacturer three, these are the key for manufacturers. I mean, if you have some sort of knowledge about vehicles, you might can guess who are they. Uh, but they are very prevalent ones, and then these two manufacturers are basically affected, and they only require two signals. And most of the vehicles from which are using actually a key fob from manufacturer one were also affected. And most of the vehicles require actually three signals. So this is already something that I was referring to in my previous slide. So some vehicles need more than two signals. So most of the vehicles need three signals. And Honda vehicles, for some reason, needs five signals. It's something like already a, a countermeasure, but then why five? And, uh, why does it work with five? And as you can see, Toyota is using a key fob from a manufacturer four, so it's not affected at all. But I have to emphasize that not the key fob itself is vulnerable in this, in this scenario. So the key fob is just emitting the signals. The main logic is basically in the receiving part, uh, and usually the key fob manufacturer is not the one who is making the receiving part in the vehicle. Now I have a demo, just because uh, I talked anyway too much, so let's see how our attack works uh, in the reality. Oh, okay, all right, so now here we are going to uh, present our attack, Rollback Works. So this is a quite new Mazda 2 uh, hatchback vehicle. Uh, we have the key fob here, so this is, now I'm just showing you that the key fob is itself the key fob which belongs to the vehicle, so if I press the open, you can see now it's open, the flashing lights are there, and I can also close it. And then now I close, you can see that the mirrors are folding, and I can reopen it again. So this is the key fob that belongs to the vehicle. And now what we are going to do 
is to record the epoch signals, uh, actually a, a few epoch signals, and we will see whether we can unlock the vehicle by just replaying those old epoch signals, uh, which we, of course, shouldn't be able to do so. So now... So this is a quick intro. I wanted to fast forward it, but basically that we are using is a quite commodity of the shelf devices. So I have a laptop, I have a HackRF connected to my laptop through USB. And then basically this is like so, uh, a we quick see hacker bundle you can So now start. what I'm going to do is just record the uh, unlock signal. So now I'm not jamming any signal or whatever. It's, this is the car rental scenario. So I have access to the key fob. So I just record one hoop unlock and another unlock and another unlock. And let's say I also uh, record a few more. I don't mind. Let's say five unlocks. Okay. Yeah. So now it's also again fast forward a bit because sometimes saving the signals takes some time. But don't worry. It's just just. So what now I'm going to signal. do is to replay these signals. I put the key fob here, so I'm not touching the key fob. There is no any uh, extra trick in the background. So what I'm what I'm going to do is to replay the signals, and now you can see that the vehicle is closed because the, the mirrors are folded, okay? So I'm just replaying the signals, and what we are going to see here is that when I replay the third signal, uh, this one, then the rolling code system will be resynchronizing back to the previous state, and then the vehicle will unlock. And every further unlock signals here will also work. You, you will also see this from the flashing light. So now I, I replay the signals. Yeah, the blue bar indicates the, the current status. So now we replay the first signal, and then the second signal, and now the third signal. And now I pause it. So now you see that the vehicle actually unlocked. The mirrors came off. So the vehicle is locked. And now all these two signals, if I, if I play further, then it you will see from the flashing lights that it still works. So it's still unlocked, too. And it still unlocks again. So now we are back to the original state where we actually left with the key fob. Uh, but I can still replay again all these signals to see whether we can do the resynchronization again. So now if I start again, what we should expect, that of course these first three signals won't work, uh, because now in the time they are somewhere here. But let's see again. So I replay the first one, nothing happens. The second one, and then the third one, and then it's again locked. The flashing signals are here, and it's keep working. OK. So now what I'm going to see and show you that now I start to use the key fob. <clears throat> so the key fob is, of course, belonging to the owner. So we, we still let the victim to, to use the key fob as usual. So now I can just lock my vehicle. I'm just leaving it, or I just unlock it again. I open the door, of course, I can sit in, I can drive away, it doesn't matter. And then I again brought back my vehicle if this is still a car sharing scenario, or I just brought back my car to my own parking lot at my home, and I just lock the vehicle, and then I go away. I leave the key fob on the top of the, the vehicle to just see. So the victim went away, and now we again we come back, we have all the previously captured signals, which is still the old signals we captured back in the past. So we don't need any more signals to be captured. We just only need this capturing process once. And now I just start uh, try to reopen the vehicle again. So I again uh, focus on the, on, the, on the mirrors, of course. So now we replay our old signals, the one, two, and for the third time, it's going to open. And then the vehicles are, uh, the, vehicle, the mirrors are unfolded and I have access to the vehicle. So yeah, this is how it, Thank you. It's not over yet. It's not over yet. Uh, so there is something new that we also found after submitting our, our, our talk uh, to Black Hat is that our attack rollback is also instruction agnostic, which means that it doesn't really matter what kind of signal you capture. So you don't even have to focus whether it's an unlock signal or not. So the thing is that we confirmed this to Mazda and also for Kia, and we're going to show you a video about that. So it doesn't matter what kind of signal that you have, it's just to be usually consecutive if that's the scenario, which makes everything even more easier. If you thought that it's already very easy to do, now you even have less things to do if you are an attacker. So basically the victim goes to the parking lot again and then presses the lock button, 
And usually you anyway press the lock button twice because the first lock button is something that is a silent lock and then you press it again just to see whether the flashing lights are on and then the vehicle honks anyway to double confirm that okay you have left your car adequately closed and then basically I have already two signals uh, and then I just wait for you to finish your grocery you come back and you're going to unlock the car and now I just realized when I rented the car here that basically if I press the unlock button wide once it only opens my side door my driving door but my wife was complaining all the time why am I not leaving uh, getting her inside so I always had to press the unlock button twice anyway so just because of these extra safety measures it's basically making our cars even more vulnerable to our attack so we can easily profit out of it. And I just also want to take a note about car sharing and car renting. So it's even much more easier, right? Because if it's a car sharing scenario, then you can easily have access to the key fob anyway. So I can record the signal and later on I just let someone else to use the vehicle. But using the websites or whatever services the car sharing uh, things are providing us, I can basically keep track of the vehicles and I can go and unlock it whenever I want. And the thing is that our attack is just about unlocking the vehicle, but in a car sharing scenario, the key fob is also usually kept inside a car. So I just replay my two signals, and then I can go later on, and I basically not just have access to the car, but I can easily steal the car. Of course, there are probably some other measures from the car sharing uh, company, but it's not to us. We so are let's going see to test this one. Uh, whether our attack is actually agnostic to the instruction embedded in the signals. So the main question here is that. Is it only the matter of the rolling code and the counters, or also it depends on what is the instruction in the signals? So now we can see that this vehicle is open. And normally we were only talking about unlock signals. In the beginning, we were always focusing on the unlock signals. We wanted to capture unlock signals only. But for the sake of the attacker, uh, it's actually easier to capture a lock signal and an analog signal because this is how we usually use the vehicle. So this is what we're going to test. So the vehicle is still unlocked. Uh, now what I'm going to do is that I'm using the key fob. I will record the signal, uh, a lock signal first because that's the usual scenario when I just left the car in the parking lot. So I, then I go away. And then I actually like imitating the scenario when the victim comes back and unlocks the vehicle because he or she wants to drive the vehicle away. So. This is what we're going to do. So now I capture a lock signal. That is a lock signal. You can see that the mirrors are folded and the vehicle is now un a lock. And then I capture an unlock signal. So it's two different signals. And I don't capture any more signals because we know that for this vehicle, we only need two signals. Uh, so now I'm going to replay this. Uh, but first, I have to save. So it's a lock and unlock. I just save it again. Uh, it takes quite some seconds. Okay, I have it. So now I just lock the vehicle, uh, at least to to get the rolling code system to be triggered at least once, uh, and eventually I'm going to unlock it at the end. So we have basically a lock signal here and an unlock signal. Uh, I just remove the space here for the sake of time. So let's see what will happen. So now we replay the lock signal and the unlock signal. And you can see that the vehicle has been unlocked. Uh, so yeah, the mirrors again came off, the emergency lights were flashing, and we can access the vehicle. So basically to prove that th this vehicle, uh, and it actually applies for the Mazda vehicle as well, that it only requires two signals, or the Mazda vehicle requires three signals, but the whole attack is agnostic to the instru instruction in the signal. So it doesn't matter if it's a lock or an unlock signal, they are using the same rolling code we just only have to replay those consecutive signals and it will work. Okay, that was the second video. So let's talk about the root cause and the mitigation, which is basically still something that are the missing pieces of the puzzle. So even though we uh, contacted some of the vendors and they got back to us, we had some sessions uh, with, with them, but basically the root cause now is still unknown. Uh, and the thing is that most of these things are anyway proprietary, so we simple researchers don't really have access to that. And to be honest, we don't have the knowledge for now to tear down the vehicle and get access to that specific ECU and see really how it works. So now we are kind of like doing some black box testing in this, uh, in this research at this stage. But we try to find something that might be the reason, but it's still just a might, a very big might. Because as I mentioned, all of that are proprietary, so you don't have access to it. But there is a key fob learning process 
which is basically standardized or at least released by one of the key for manufacturer, which is microchip. So now you know that out of the four that I was referring to in my previous table, one of them is microchip. And they have a, some kind of documentation when you have this key fob learning process. It's basically a process when you lost your key fob and you get a new one from a, from a dealership and then you want the key fob to be learned to the vehicle to make it a, to usable. So the thing how, what we've seen is that basically there are some steps, you don't really have to focus all the steps in this flowchart, but there are some steps that are quite in line with how we are doing. So you can see that there is a one unlock signal or whatever, and then there is an, a second button press, and at the end there is the key fob uh, synchronization process. On the other hand, you see a lot of other boxes which are not quite in line how our attack rollback works, because normally, as you can see, you somehow, uh, sorry, this one, you somehow have to enter into the learning mode, and once you learn the key fob to the vehicle, it automatically exits from the mode. So it's either some of the vehicles are in the learning mode forever, I don't know, maybe, can be an, uh, a thing. The other thing is that also there is no indication about the time frame, how fast you have to press the buttons when you're learning the key fob. Uh, the vehicle reaction is also not part of the specification. Once you are learning a key fob, will the vehicle really act uh, according to the button you're pressing, we don't know. And the other thing we don't know is that no one really learned a key fob to the vehicle if you already have the key fob itself. So what happens basically when you're learning an already existing key fob to the vehicle, it's also not part of the specification. But at least it's something that mimics how our attack works. Uh, what about the mitigation? So I usually say something like uh, a general advice that works against jamming attacks if you are just very precautious and you always watch when you press a button how the vehicle reacts, that's okay. But rollback, as I mentioned, doesn't need jamming at all. So it's kind of like a passive listener uh, and just because of the time agnostic feature you won't be able to uh, basically prevent it. So probably the best thing to do is uh, do some additional measure to the system, not only use rolling code but use some timestamps or whatever to make it more, uh, uh, I mean, less susceptible to attack. So the three main takeaways of our talk is basically that we show that this is this attack called rollback, and we show that by capturing and replaying a couple of signals, and uh, we can basically resynchronize the rolling code system, and I can also unlock your vehicle. And uh, we proved it that many Asian cars are basically vulnerable, and it doesn't matter what instructions are in the key fob. The other thing is that unlike Rojam, our attack is basically does not require signal jamming at all. You can only capture the signal once, uh, and then you can use it indefinitely, basically, for live, I would say. Uh, and the captured signals, uh, yeah, as I just mentioned, you can replay it as, at any time in the future and as many times as required. So it's, uh, you're almost like the owner of the car at some point. Uh, and uh, the third most important part is was just basically about my previous slide that we still don't know the root cause, so please don't rush into e to, to eBay and buy a Hacker F on your own and then... And, and, uh, you know, use this knowledge that you just gained here and then play around in the parking lot. Uh, but there's no explicit mitigation for the time being, uh, but probably there could be some measures that might be uh, implemented in the future, but at, at, at now we don't know this. So for that, I'd like to uh, finish our talks. Thanks for, for joining us, and I would like to also thank again for our co-authors from NUS who take part, and now we are ready to take questions.